this happens like clockwork every offseason, and you and I have been the victim of it. How many times have you caught yourself during the NFL draft watching your favorite player be selected and then internally screaming, that guy, he's irreplaceable. That guy, we can't find a similar player to match his skill set. That production, it's not going to be duplicated. And then like eight months go by and you see the player who was sitting in the wings actually produce similar, if not better results. And you go, yeah, okay, it was my bad. I jumped the gun a little bit. But there are some times that you have to trust your intuition. And there are players that will be hard to duplicate their success, especially in the SEC. And I figured today, let's go through the conference and pick out the players and the household names that are going to be hard seeing similar results at their positions in 2024. But what's going on, SEC Unfiltered? It's Cole Thompson here. Make sure that you like and comment down below, which is the one player that is almost impossible to replace production-wise in 2024. And hit subscribe because... We're on the race to become the number one YouTube show talking about our favorite conference in all of college athletics. Download the podcast version of the show. Like, rate, hit subscribe. Also leave a comment telling us what you like about the podcast. Download us on social media, wherever you get your social media platforms, at Mr. Cole Thompson and at SEC Unfiltered. We're on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, you name it, any app that Elon Musk has created, we got you covered. And to keep up with the daily content surrounding your favorite conference and all of college athletics, make sure you visit secunfiltered.com. There's always going to be players that are hard to replace. And I'm not saying that you're going to get immediate results with them, but I am talking about these players, these specific players that basically you can expect some regression in. They're not going to be perfect. It doesn't mean you're going to have problems. It just means they're not going to be at the same level of what you imagined it going into the offseason. And the first name, of course, is going to be Brock Bowers. There has never been a tight end to be a two-time John Mackey Award winner. That's the baseline. I don't need to go much further than that. And I will because of my care, but... Part of the thing that really worked for this offense so much was the ability to have a speed threat with the physicality of a linebacker. He was almost impossible for linebackers to cover. He was almost physically imposing to defensive backs, especially nickel defenders. He ran routes like a wide receiver. He had arguably the best hands in all of college football. He was a great overall balance maker when it came to creating separation across the middle of the field. And he was a security blanket for whoever needed him to be the quarterback, whether it was Carson Beck, whether it was Connor Stockton, whether it was, you know, whether it was Stetson Bennett, Brock Vandergriff could have been QB one and the same results probably would have occurred because of what you had in Athens between the hedges. You had number 19 acting like the number one receiver. And I'm not going to go ahead and judge the Raiders for taking him at pick number 13. I love Michael Mayer out of Notre Dame, but the bottom line is that when you look at a Bowers, your team is going to be better because of it. And, and there are weapons in Athens. And in fact, if you haven't watched Ben Yasurik's tape just yet, uh, please do so. Uh, if you're bored at home, Georgia fans, on a Saturday night, type in Ben Yasurik stand for 2023. Th this kid reminds me so much of the Adonai Mitchell persona where you leave your school to better your chances of getting drafted at a higher selection and you ball out. But just because you added in Ben Yusurik does not mean that you are adding in the exact clone of Brock Bowers. The same thing goes for a guy like Oscar Delp with Dylan Bell. They're really talented playmakers, but the X factor that was number 19 was the number one reason why the passing attack was always in symphony. It was always smooth. And you watched it a little bit when it deteriorated when Bowers missed time. It's going to be really hard to find somebody who can come in right away and duplicate that similar success. George, uh, Jane Daniels out of LSU. Guy won the Heisman Trophy. I can move on. I literally could. I'm not going to because if I want to tell the story for you guys, but when you look at just not only losing Mike Dembrock, you're, you're losing the mobility aspect of what JD5 did. And the reason why I believe that most of us can all come to terms, whether or not we like Bo Nix, whether or not we like Michael Penix, having a player that made history with over 3,500 passing yards and 1,000 rushing yards in a single season, that's the Heisman. That's the guy that you target. That's the guy that you believe is going to be a difference maker from the jump and clearly the best player in college football. He had over 50 plus touchdowns when you include the rushing attack. He averaged over seven yards per play as a runner. He was great in the open field. And Derek Nussmeyer is going to be a phenomenal passer. In fact, a buddy of mine actually texted me not too long ago and said, do not be shocked when Garrett Nussmeyer keeps the tradition alive of LSU quarterbacks in the first round. And I kind of eye-rolled at that, but would it shock you with that arm strength, with the consistency of what they're going to run down in Baton Rouge, with the wide receivers that were added in, like C.J. Daniels, like Xavion Thomas? No, it wouldn't. 
But there's the elemental factor of just being a dual threat playmaker, trusting your legs when the pocket collapses and creating something out of nothing. You may not have that with Garrett Nussmeyer. You're going to have great consistency. The deep ball is there. It's Uncle Rico 2.0. But when you have the rushing attack, the way that you can go ahead and trust that every play is going to turn into a positive and not a negative, that's where there is this clear separation. And Daniels, I think he can be a successful quarterback in the NFL. I'm not sure he's going to live up to the number two hype. That's neither here nor there. I care about him in college. What he did when he was at LSU will forever be remembered and glorified in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and throughout the SEC. But just go ahead and remember that that element, that second gusto, that crescendo that created a chasm of miscues on defense for teams, that will be very hard to replace with number five, not your backfield. Speaking of defense, I want to go with a lot of Alabama players. I'm trying to limit this list down to just two per team at most. I think Terry and Arnold's really hard to duplicate. And it's not because of I don't like Cooley McKinstry, and it's not because I don't like Dallas Turner or Chris Brazel or anyone else. It's mainly because having a number one corner is almost deadly successful in today's college football. And it's the same in the NFL. I was having a conversation with one of my NFL buddies not too long ago, and he told me, when you look in today's game, the two positions that have benefited the most from the passing attack being dynamic as all hell is pass rushers and cornerbacks. And every team needs to have a number one corner. Cooley McKinstry was the more consistent playmaker over his time in Tuscaloosa. But this past year, you were not going to find a better cornerback in the SEC, in my opinion, than number three for Alabama. He was great in physical press man coverage. He was great in off ball. He was able to turn the tide immediately. And I think that he took something from that game against Texas in week two, where you watched him have multiple miscues against both Adonai Mitchell and Xavier Worthy. And I think he just used that as ammunition and revenge fuel to set the wave of being an all-American, all-SEC type player in 2023. He was great when it came to open field tackling. He was physical. He was not afraid to lay his body on the line. He wanted to show not only Nick Saban, but also basically the entire country, yeah, I'm him. I'm that guy. And there's some talented playmakers in the back end. I even got a guy like Malachi Moore that could even play on the outside if you really want to. Losing Caleb Downs is probably the biggest loss to replace, but I'm only taking draft picks right now. Arnold is a player to where if you don't have a number one cornerback, you have to find one. And if you can't find one, you are probably going to have to have a great pass rush. And for me, it's going to be really hard to replace Terry and Arnold. It's going to be hard to replace everyone on that defense, especially with the new formation. But at the same time, I feel like having that number one boundary cornerback gives you a second wind and always keeps you ahead of the curve. It takes away an element of the passing game and it forces your quarterback to have to throw against you rather than toward you. People are going to ask me real fast, am I putting Dallas Turner on this list? No, I'm not. And, and I'll go really quick with this. Um, it's a new defense. The one thing that we could talk about with Nick Saban for years has been his attentiveness to offensive dynamic sees. He's not afraid to make up mix and switches. He's not afraid to trust the playbook in the hands of Lane Kiffin or Steve Sarkeesian or countless others. This has been his defense in his baby since 2008. Like they have not made any changes regardless of the coordinator. The coordinator comes in and is told, hey, we're running this, figure it out. And so now that Kane Womack is taking over, it's a brand new system. I think they have some good pass rushers in Tuscaloosa, but it's really hard for me to judge what is going to be that pass rush when you're completely revamping the entire schematics of what is the front seven. Texas, I know that Xavier Worthy has fast, is, is fast. I know he has speed. I know that he is a good route runner. You either have it or you don't. But to me, Adonai Mitchell, this was the reason you went to the college football playoff. This was the reason that you won the Big 12 for the first time since 2009. This was the reason why you were able to feel confident in your quarterback, even when you had to go ahead and turn to Malik Murphy. Because Adonai Mitchell was a playmaker that always had number one mantra, but wasn't in a number one offense. Like when you look at Georgia, they knew how to throw the football. Stetson Bennett was slinging it around the yard. It was short, but it was complete and it was concise. They never really targeted the wide receivers outside of Lad McConkey. Tight end play was great. Tight end play has always been great. But wide receivers you haven't had a 1,000 yard playmaker in years. And so Adonai Mitchell goes down to Austin. He goes to be closer to his daughter. He goes to an offense that is a little bit more pro style, spread out, complex. 
And he ends up being not just the X receiver. He ends up being the X weapon that opens up the rest of the passing attack. And there's speed coming to Austin this year. You, you brought over Isaiah Bond from Alabama. You were able to go keep Jonte Cook back in the building. I think he is about ready to have a force field of a day in the SEC. If you haven't been paying attention to number two in Austin, best of luck to you. I think that when you also look at guys like Matthew Golden, they add value. I think that even when you look at the special teams of what you're losing for Worthy, there's names that can come in and be difference makers pretty quickly. I don't know if you're going to get that red zone target like Adonai Mitchell. He was great inside the 20s. He was great inside the pylon. He was always a clutch factor. And you go look back at last season. The reason why I honestly think Adonai Mitchell was the last playmaker to see the football come his way in the Sugar Bowl was because Quinn Ewers knew that if I had to trust anybody, I want to trust the guy who has been a lifesaver for me inside the numbers. And that was A.D. Mitchell. And you have speed, and you have talent, and you have really good wide receivers. And I even think that losing a guy like Jatavion Sanders, you might be able to replace it with Amari Nyblack. It's really hard to have a six foot four receiver that runs a four three nine that has that vertical presence, can be a good blocker in the open field, and get that same type of production where teams know we can't double team Xavier Worthy because Mitchell's going to go open and he's going to terrorize us. We can't double team Mitchell because then we're just leaving whoever our safety is over the top to have to cover a guy like Worthy in that speed. It's irreplaceable. That, to me, is why this offense was so great last year. You had two complementary pieces that understood their assignments. I think you have speed. The size, the physicality, that feels like it's missing just a little bit right now when it comes to uh, when it comes to Austin. J.C. Latham, I, I know that you have Elijah Pritchett, and I think that he's going to be a fine tackle. I know that Caden Proctor is coming back this year, and so I don't really worry about the sense of what will the offensive line be. It's the leadership aspect. You know, you get a guy like Latham that was a three-year starter on an offensive tackle and on the offensive line just in general. You have to be a special talent to automatically be a starter as a freshman underneath Nick Saban. And that's not a priority thing. Like, there's always been freshmen that have been fixtures of the team. They've had roles. But if you are drafted in the top 10 from Alabama, 95% of the time, you were at least a multi-year starter, if not a starter when you were a freshman. And because of that, I think that losing that leadership is a big deal. Because you can remember, like, after the, the South Florida game, this was where the offense really started to kind of hitch itself onto new heights. They started to really trust what Jalen Milrow was. And, and I felt like at the same time, the offensive line was playing a lot better. They felt a lot more confident because they realized we can't have a performance like that against teams in the SEC. Because if we do... We're going to get thrown out of the building. We're going to be the most lackluster, laughable team in Tuscaloosa history. And so I think when it came to that, you watched an upgrade in the run blocking. Uh, you were locked in any, every single time with J.C. Latham. His hand placement was phenomenal. Once he grabbed you, you were dead on, dead on arrival. There was no shot of you coming out on top. And so to me, when you lose a talent like that, the leadership like that, that's really, really hard to find a consistent playmaker. And I think Pritchett's going to be good. I know Proctor. He's gotten better. He got better as the season progressed. Going into year two, he's going to be even, I think, more stable. And, and you got to remember, this is the Joe Moore winning offensive line coach that's coming down to Tuscaloosa with Kalen DeBoer. So there's something that can be said about that. I just worry about what that leadership in the huddle is going to be like. It's great when you have somebody who is a proven commodity like Parker Brailsfold coming on over from Seattle. But this is a guy that has SEC experience. I feel like he's going to be really, really challenging to replace on the right side of the trenches. You know what isn't going to be challenging to replace? Your money. Because if I'm going to teach you how to get some money by using my bookie. The NBA playoffs are heating up, and it's the perfect time to elevate your game simply by visiting mybookie.ag. With my bookie, you can bet everywhere, anytime, and never miss a shot. Make sure that you're paying attention because we got the divisional rounds coming up. Phoenix, they've already moved on. I mean, Phoenix, they've already been eliminated. Minnesota, already moved on. And congratulations, UGA. You got yourself a playmaker. Who's going to win it all? Go ahead and place your bets. My bookie makes it easy to get paid with tons of boosted props and slam dunk parlays. It boosts now and it posts daily. So if you want to go ahead and get a head start, come use the house money by using the promo code SECU. 
when you make your first deposit. That's SECU to claim a limited time bonus when you sign up with your first deposit. The NBA playoffs are full of SEC talents everywhere. Don't you want to see your favorite talent go ahead and make it to the finals? Go bet on them now. Go bet on your favorite team at mybookie.ag, wherever you get your betting systems. Now, let's go ahead and talk about Kamari Laster. Laster is a guy, the, the defense for Georgia was really interesting because of, I feel like that this is again, turning into what Nick Saban was for years. Wash, rinse, repeat. We're going to be fine at linebacker. We're going to be fine at edge rusher. It'll be cool. I, I feel like Georgia's in that same boat, but the reason why I put Kamari Laster out here is kind of the same reason why I mentioned Terry and Arnold. Having a number one cornerback on the outside takes away a huge dividend when it comes to your passing attack. Having somebody on the perimeter that can make plays and be that alpha dog is almost irreplaceable. And the thing that I continuously heard whenever it came to a guy like Laster was never about his on-field demeanor. It was about his alpha mentality when he took the field from the locker room. He carried that persona all four quarters. He never had an off switch. He wanted to show every SEC wide receiver, whether it was Trey Harris, whether it was Luther Burden, whether it was Jermaine Burton, he wanted to show every single receiver. You don't come into Athens and you don't find a way to mess around and find out. I'm going to show you what pure pain looks like. And if you think that you're scoring a touchdown on me, best of luck. He allowed two touchdowns in three years of coverage. And he was a two-time national champion. That persona is going to do wonders, I think, for the Houston Texans. He's going to play with D'Amico Ryans, another SEC alum, which is really cool. But I think when you look at Javon Bullard, you look at Tyke Smith, they're hard to replace, but they're almost still able to find guys that can come in and do their job. Where Lassiter, that alpha dog persona, someone's got to pick up the mantle and it comes with experience. That's kind of just the bottom line for me. It comes with showing the reps. And I don't know if right now there is a guy on Georgia besides Smilakai Stark who can be that alpha dog. And so now you're asking Stark to really step up and take over that role because he kind of has to. Texas Byron Murphy. Uh, again, I want to keep it down to two players per team. So a lot of you are going to say, well, what about Demondre Sweat? The, the man won the Outland Trophy. For those of you that don't know what the Outland Trophy is, it is basically the fat man Heisman because you're never going to see, I think, a defensive lineman take home the award. And Sweat earned the right to be the uh, Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year. The way that he fortified the trenches in Austin paved the way for a Big 12 title. But when you look at Murphy, who did go in the top 20 picks, the slipperiness, the elusiveness, the ability to slip and slide past every single offensive lineman and force his way in the backfield, running backs had no shot. Quarterbacks had no shot. There was a huge difference when it came to the consistency and the dynamics of what was this defensive line. And that was why they were one of the best in the country. They knew each other's roles extremely well. But you can get big. You can find big players. They come around once in a blue. They come around every every single year. And you can go into a weight room facility. You can sit down with a training staff. And Steve is probably sitting somewhere going, we need to get a big time playmaker. That speed, that slipperiness, the ability to utilize your hands to win at the point of attack and beat bigger offensive linemen because if you have the lower center of gravity, that's just hard to do. You either are just small and quick and timely and have great hand usage, or you don't. And you can learn some of those things, but then there's other things that aren't teachable. They're just athletic traits that are there. And now you're going over to the SEC, where the competition is going to be that much more strenuous. It's really hard to think that you're going to find somebody that can have a similar persona the way that Murphy did. I'm not saying that Sweat wasn't worthy of a selection here. He absolutely was, but to me... Having the ability to take on double teams and still win almost every one of your reps, that's irreplaceable. And that's exactly why I think that when you look at a guy like Murphy, he's almost impossible to replace. South Carolina's Xavier Leggett. This was one that we called. I said I thought Carolina was going to take him. I did not think it was going to come in the round one. And you know what? Good for him. And by the way, anybody out there that is now watching these videos and saying, I don't understand what he's saying. This, th this is not a channel made for you. You don't understand our SEC brand and culture. That is about as true Southern South Carolina as you can get. Now he gets to go play in Charlotte right in front of his family. He had over 1,200 yards last year. You have to look way down the pecking order at Trey Knox to figure out how big of a separation there was between wide receiver one and target number two. 
Craig Knox had less than 50 catches. He had less than 500 yards. He had less than three touchdowns. Because Xavier Leggett was literally, at times, the only weapon for Spencer Rattler. And now you're adding in Lenora Sellers. You still have a makeshift offensive line that may or may not have improved this offseason. You do have a good run game with Rocket Sanders coming on over from Arkansas. I think that is a huge win. But how do you feel about your wide receiver room? Because Juice Wells was supposed to be a difference maker. He's now down in Oxford. And you don't have a six foot one physical son of a B that's going to be able to beat up on cornerbacks. You just don't have that. And in a year where it does feel like pressure is starting to rise for Shane Beamer. And I love Shane Beamer. I would run through a wall for Shane Beamer. In fact, if I was just to make a list of coaches that I want to go ahead and just talk ball with for hours on end and maybe take to the movies, Shane Beamer would be one. I think he has probably a really good taste in the movie. Like his, his discography has got to be phenomenal. But this is a perfect year and you need a perfect receiver. I don't think you have that right now in Columbia. And it's because the get is about ready to be legit in Charlotte. And to me, that's really hard to find a second win. Uh, three more guys really fast. Oklahoma's Tyler Guyton. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on him, but the main thing, you need offensive linemen going into the SEC. Having experience is something that is just phenomenal at your disposal. The offensive line is expected to be a weak point for Oklahoma going into the year. I think Oklahoma's defense can get them to 10 wins. I think their offensive line can keep them at seven. I think having a guy like Guyton, who is probably going to be a staple on the line in Dallas for years, is a massive win for Brent Venables' team. That's going to be really hard to find that duplicate success. Year one in a brand new conference where it just means more. It just really stinks. Next one up, Texas A&M's Anaya Smith. It's the leadership aspect. You're getting a brand new coach. You feel good about this roster. You get back your quarterback in Connor Wegman. And Smith offered everything from the rushing attack at times in the red zone to playing in the slot to lining up outside to the punt return squad. He's the only player in SEC history to finish with over 4,000 total yards. I mean, a, a 3,000 total yards of scrimmage and over 1,200 have come on return yards. That's just impossible to think of because it's never happened before. So how do you sit here and look from a leadership standpoint and everything else that comes with it and go, yeah, that guy we can find another agent zero. There's going to be a number zero in, in College Station this year. There's not going to be an agent zero the way that he was successful in this Aggies offense. And it would have been really fun to see him with Colin Klein. Last one, guy didn't even get drafted. I don't really care. This is for vibes only. Cody Schrader, to me, was the epitome of what Missouri football is about to be. Undervalued, underappreciated, never garnering the amount of respect that it's earned. And yet still here they are showing the world that they mean business and that they're not going down quietly. He was the X factor for this offense last year because there were games where you looked at Brady Cook. And I know in another video, I said Connor Cook. I meant Brady Cook. My apologies. There were games where you knew that Brady Cook wasn't at his best. He wasn't at his peak. You know, it was the run game. And you know, it was the offensive leadership. And that's because of Schrader. Schrader was phenomenal. I cannot wait to see him hopefully find a role on Kansas City's offense. And the good news is for all Tiger fans, he's staying close to home. He's staying close to Columbia. But even though you bring in Marcus Carroll, I think he's a great running back. It's that leadership. It's that, well, now people have to respect us kind of thing. And so now you're asking Luther Burden to step up into that role. Now you're asking Theo Weiss to step up. Now you're asking somebody on the defense to step up. You got to have that voice of reason. To me, Schrader simply for vibes only is why I put him on this list. When you are disrespected the way that Missouri has been, you need that one person to be, nope, I'm going to show you why. That was the dude who's going to step up and be that playmaker. Make sure you like, comment down below. Who is the one player in the SEC that is irreplaceable in your mind? Make sure that you also tell us in the comments section what other videos you want to see in the not-so-distant future. Rate, review, hit subscribe. Make sure you're also downloading the podcast version of the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, really wherever you get your podcasting systems. Thanks so much for watching. And make sure to keep up with all of our daily content found at secunfiltered.com. Until next time, SEC fans, I'm Cole Thompson. Later.